Good morning and a very warm welcome to all of you. My name is Ilinka Benson. I am CEO here at SNS. And it's a really great pleasure for us to have you here today because this is a special occasion for SNS. It marks the debut of our new annual conference series, Making Better Use of Research, that is part of our 75th anniversary celebration. Since the start of SNS in 1948, SNS has been a catalyst, bringing academia, business, and government together to um, deal with pressing, pressing societal issues of various kinds. To me, this mission seems more important than ever today in these times when polarization is increasing, the frequency which with facts are questions and complex matters are oversimplified is really large and a big problem for all of us. And I'm convinced that we here together can contribute to bridging the gap between research and practical applications. Involving more researchers in shaping policies, testing innovations, and also assessing their societal impact. The purpose of this conference is exactly this, getting you together, sharing experiences, learning from each other, and um, also, of, I hope, taking the opportunity to form new connections and maybe plant the seeds for future collaborations. In other words, this conference is all about the heart of SNS, helping research make a difference in the real world. And we couldn't do this without the general support from the donors to our anniversary fund. So I would really like to thank all of you who have contributed to this fund. It means very much for SNS, both of course, the monetary, the sort of uh, the means to make this happen, uh, but also the symbolic value that you support SNS and our mission. Uh, we're very honored to have Professor Nicholas Bloom here today from Stanford University. And I will leave it to Gabriella to make a proper introduction of Nicholas Bloom, but I would like to say that at SNS we have taken a great interest and been very impressed with Nick's research for a long time now. Um, you were here the first time in 2015, then presenting uh, your work and your co-workers co work on management practices in schools and, and student performance, and we also uh, summarize this research in a research brief in Swedish, which you can find on our website. I think the results still hold. Um, and uh, then you participate in the Tillsand Summit in 2021, uh, sharing your insights on your research on remote work, which at the time suddenly was of great uh, interest for everybody and still is. And you will tell us more about it now today. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to our other speakers, which Gabriella will also soon introduce, and, and also to all of you. I mean, you will make this conference, so don't sit back and relax. <laughs> Stay uh, sort of uh, alert. Uh, and now I will, um, I will hand over to Gabriella kiriko Wilstedt, Head of Members and Research Director here at SNS, who will guide us through the day. She and senior project manager Emily Lekeberg are the brains behind this conference. They have put a lot of passion and effort into making this happen. So I'm very grateful to them. And now uh, the floor is yours, Gabriela. Thank you so much, Elinka. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it almost feels like we've been planning this conference for 75 years now. Um, but it's uh, truly an honor to be standing before such a, a distinguished audience as yourself. And uh, it's uh, my absolute privilege to be the moderator throughout the day. And I hope you all are as excited as I am about this opportunity to learn, discuss, 
make some new connections and hopefully also wake up tomorrow with a lot of new ideas and new perspectives. Um, as you know, we have an impressive lineup of speakers to help us do so. So let me just brief you on the agenda that I hope will magically appear. Yes, um, starting with a session on uh, management practices, we are very uh, pleased to welcome Professor Nicholas Bloom. I'll provide a uh, deeper introduction shortly. Uh, we will then be joined by Joachim Toag, who is Professor of Economics and Researcher at the Research Institute of Industrial Economics, IFN, here in Stockholm. And then we'll also be hearing insights from Thomas Ekman, who is, of course, newly appointed CEO of uh, Axel Jonsson. And in the afternoon, we will delve into the new landscape, or maybe not so new landscape, of hybrid work. And we will then again be joined by Nick and also by Katarina Barry, who is uh, Chief Human Resource Officer at uh, Spotify, and Hanna Fager, who is uh, the Chief People Officer at Volvo Cars. So thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. So without further ado, uh, let's get to it. I am uh, thrilled to introduce and welcome Professor Nicholas Bloom back to SNS. Uh, Nick is the uh, William D. Eberly Professor of Economics at Stanford University. His research is uh, focused on working from home, management practices and uncertainty. And he leads the World Management Survey, which is an initiative spanning over two decades um, to build the first cross-country and cross-industry data set on management practices. Professor Bloom will start off the day by guiding us through the links between management and firm performance. Please join me in welcoming him. Thanks so much. It's it, it's uh, lovely. Lincoln and I were doing exactly the same thing. I remember, but I remember talking in this room and going through that. I was looking back on my uh, email inboxes. Yeah, it was 2015. We were just, I was just talking to Thomas. It feels like the world is divided between pre and post pandemic and pre pandemic. I'm like, I can't remember anything as to which year it was, but it was 2015. And yeah, I've been involved. You'll see this long connections to this research with SNS over many years, actually. So, um, so there's a there's a long history. I'll stand up here. There's, there's, a, there's a long history of uh, work on management practices. So this is a paper. There's about 150 years old, written by this person, Francis Walker, who I'll tell you more about in a minute. Uh, if you read papers written 150 years ago, they don't seem to use full stops. It just is like vast sentences. It's kind of weirdly written. It was actually in the first year of the Quarterly Journal of Economics, which is the oldest journal in economics. So I wouldn't say it's the most exciting read, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's there. And the, the reason I put it up is it was written by this person here, Francis Walker, who was the founding president of the American Economics Association. In all of these old fashioned photos, people always look very unhappy. I think they just were unhappy. Uh, I think actually, apparently, he's, he might be trying to iron his trousers. <laughs> like, I think the Victorians are so nervous about taking their clothes off, they iron them while wearing them or something. It's a bit hard to tell what's going on. But the reason he's up here is he ran the 1870 and 1880 U.S. census. And the 1881 one in particular is uh, very high quality. My co-authors say, like, you know, if you publish it in 1887, that's 17 years. You know, this is a long delay. But he did eventually publish this, this paper. And he claimed, if you read the book, that basically management accounts for the variations in firm performance. And he'd looked in thousands of firms in the census. This guy is a total character as well. He was he fought in the Civil War. He was captured and escaped from a southern uh, prison, Libby. I mean, there are no academics I know that that exciting that you know break out of prison of war camps and stuff. So anyway, um, this is a photo from the airport bookstore uh, in San Francisco Airport. This quote is no longer quite as true. I'm going to kind of show you the update. But Chad Siverson, who's a Chicago professor, wrote. There's a lot of speculation and it's very hard to know. And the reason partly is if you look at the airport bookstore, they have Steve Jobs, you know, uh, Apple, uh, Ike Ike the Swedish Ikea, Starbucks. There's lots of case studies. The question is how generic it is. And it's really not obvious to me that just looking at 10 very successful firms is the best way to learn about this. And in fact, in fact, this was perfect over dinner because Gustav was saying he used to be at M McKinsey. I used to be at McKinsey years ago. And I was there from 2001 to 2003 in the heyday of Enron. And loads of my training at the beginning was all about how Enron was so great. And then Enron obviously wasn't so great. And all the training had Enron. It just all got redone. 
Uh, so it's a kind of, you know, for, change in regime and Enron has never mentioned again. What I like is that the NBA has changed the symbol from that to this. So it's always like a perfect Enron symbol. So I, I'm always a bit nervous about drawing conclusions on just one firm because, you know, we were trained on Enron and then suddenly just no longer should we think about Enron. So what I'm going to do is show you overview on a huge data project involving a lot of institutions, many universities, the census, Ascension, McKinsey and others have been involved in this. So uh, it's actually 21 years since we started this project. Uh, for anyone living in America, you know you have to be 21 to drink, which strikes me as absurd. You can, you know, you can far, far weaponry, you can get married, you can drive a car. You can have like a drive-by shooting at a wedding age 16, but you can't drink till you're 21 for some reason. So, uh, you know, certainly I, 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 we let our kids have beer. But um, I'm going to celebrate 21 years of the World Management Survey and just go through a bunch of data from this over the last 21 years. Then I'll talk a bit about RCT in India. Then I'll talk about strategy, which is kind of really different and a harder challenge. We've been making some research on that recently. And then finally, I'll just talk about how to improve management, think of SNS's role in terms of policy and information. Some micro, but a lot of it's like macro policy. And I have to say on this, Sweden's basically doing the right thing. You know, it, it, I, and taking the right thing for given is not easy. I used to think Britain was doing all the right stuff and then it voted on Brexit and unwound some part of, you know, good policy. So I wouldn't take good policy for given, you know, the UK until recently had pretty good policy in terms of free trade and openness and is unwound part of that with a pretty disastrous left turn. So this is the World Management Survey. There are uh, five of us involved in it. Um, my team members look, you know, some of them are pretty glamorous. So I thought I'd upgrade myself. Uh, no one wants to see some, you know, aging British academic on there. So I thought I would. Uh, but so this is the five of us running it. Uh, we've covered 20,000 firms in 35 countries, including Sweden and quite a few waves. So how does it work? So um, originally, the genesis of this, is, of this came from McKinsey, actually, a long time ago. This is going back to the late 90s. There's a guy called uh blair mccallum who is a practice expert and he spent a lot of his time going around factories and he said to john dowdy who's a very senior director you know i can walk into a factory and i can tell you pretty rapidly whether it's badly managed or wall run and i think the same would be true often for retailers particularly if you get to see the back office he said it's really obvious it's really fast and john dowdy said well how and blair mccallum said there's just a bunch of telltale signs and john dowdy said well look write it down as a scoring grid we can use it potentially within work as a, like an initial health check so they came up with a scoring grid with 18 questions around three areas. One is monitoring. So do you collect information? Do you use it for feedback processes? Do you use it for continuous improvement? Think of this as kind of somewhat the predecessor of, of big data. The second is targets. So are people fit set targets? Do the short run add up to the long run? Does the top cascade down to the bottom? Are they binding or ridiculously too hard or too, too easy? Like one anecdote I remember on targets being too hard was BP. So BP had these targets on return on capital employed that were just, they just couldn't, people couldn't make, meet them. So what happened is he used to skip on safety. The only way to make, you know, 13% return on capital employed was to skip safety. And they had multiple incidents, including the one in the Mexico and in you know, Texas City and stuff. And then um, we're going to run telephone interviews of senior managers. So what, what happens if Thomas is well, it wouldn't be Thomas because it, we run the senior manager. It would be something like two below him. One of his factories would ring up and we'd get them on the phone. That itself is not that straightforward, but there are ways we train people. We actually have whole groups of people that run these interviews. This is a photo from 2006. This is one of the waves I managed personally. It was like running a, setting up a small company. I had 30 people and then we hired six managers for the summer. And then I was kind of on top of this. So you basically had to hire 40 people, get them up and running for the summer. The amazing thing is, uh, these are the two Swedish interviews. So Laura Sambris and Karina Wendell, we hired into the project. When I was looking at this photo last week in preparation for this, it's like, wow, the coincidence is that person there was nothing to do with Karina and Rihada. He's called Mike Hooper. He happened to be some American doing American interviews. He was just on a different master's program at the LSE and we hired him into the project. Turns out they got married. <laughs> so... Uh, in fact, they now have two children, and it turns out that Nikki Lambda and K Kevin Krabenhoff also got married and have kids from the project. So there's only 40 people, but you know, we have like two couples, and it was like amazing. But 
they just sat together. There's nothing else. I mean, I, I assume they just started talking. I, but, you know, they, if you spend six or eight hours a day in the same desk phoning up companies, sometimes they're pleasant, sometimes they're not so pleasant. Probably you end up talking more to each other. So um, secondly, how do we get firms to participate? We only want to run management interviews. So if, you're, if I'm interviewing Jürgen, for example, um, I'm never going to ask for financial data down the phone. It's a complete no-no. It really upsets companies. Reg FD in the US means if a public listed company are not even allowed to do it. It's a complete non-starter. So mostly outside the US, across Europe, if it's true in Sweden, you can get basic financials for public and private firms from other sources. So we don't want to ask about that. What instead we ask about is management practices, which people are more willing to talk to. We also have endorsement letters. So here is, for example, Bank of India, Bank of Japan, Bank of China, uh, Bank de France. Here's the Rix Bank. We got an old letter. And here's SNS. Mia, uh, I think one of her last acts was to, uh, must be not, I'm not sure when she stepped down, but she, she, she kind of, so we use these letters and the university names to get people to talk to us. It seems to help. I wouldn't say it's straightforward or easy. We're only getting about a 40% response rate. We can eventually get firms on the phone. How do you get reasonable management data, we're going to use um, double blind. So imagine Gabriella is um, the company. Imagine she's the plant manager, Sven Plastics. I, as the interviewer, wouldn't know the management performance in advance. This is a 700-person firm. It's privately held. I'm not going to look them up. So I hopefully go into the interview blind. I just don't have a preconception. I have no idea what they do. I just know they have 700 people and they make, I mean, that's their name. She wouldn't be told in advance she's being scored. And the way that works is we have open questions like this, which is pretty critical. So I would say, get ready, tell, it, tell me, how is performance tracked in your factory? And she'd chat for a bit and, you know, she says all sorts of stuff. So if she's pretty kick-ass, she's going to say, we have display boards at every single thing. They're updated every day. I have metrics. I have daily meetings, weekly meetings. Like if she's very dated. Or at the other end, we've had firms say, well, we, we have great tracking. Once a year, we look at the accounts. And it's like, that's basically not tracking. And so we ask, you know, we go through this and after a few questions, I'd say, if I visited the factory, what would I see? Tell me, what would I see if I walked around? What indicators? And you try to ask what's called open questions. So questions that don't have yes, no answers because they tend to be leading. So the, the less we speak and the more the manager speaks, the better. We really don't want to lead. These questions are set up to try and be open. So Gabriella talked for a while and I can kind of get the sense, it's not perfect, whether she's one out of five, basically there's not much tracking up to five out of five, which is pretty continuous, pretty pervasive tracking. We're looking, whoops, we're looking for, gone too far, we're looking for things like this. So this is a picture from a car plant. Um, and if you look up here, this is called the production control board. Notice one, it's not electronic. This is not about high tech, but it's there and it's at each stage of the production process. For anyone that's visited a car plant, they have multiple buildings. There's it's like stamping, uh, welding, painting, and then assembly. And this is the final stage, the assembly one. The first three tend to be run by robots. Humans still do assembly. So this is the assembly stage, the final stage in a car plant. There's a big belt. It goes round. It takes about you know 16 hours to go from start to finish. So this is this be this kind of thing at multiple stages. I visited a lot. I went actually the, actually to the Toyota plant at Nagoya, which was fascinating to see this thing. It's like so intricate. It's so organized. You just can't imagine this belt is moving along slowly. And you have like 11 seconds to do your task because the belt keeps going. And they figure it out. And they don't want you to be too slow. And if it's taking too long, they put more people. This is how these production line work. I visited Denso in the same trip, which is a supplier. I visited a lot of factories. And this kind of thing is what you're looking for. Here's another example in uh, retail or tech. This is trip.com or C-Trip as it used to be called. I'll talk about that this afternoon and work from home stuff. So I've been out to the HQ in Shanghai a few times. I just took this photo. This is walking around. You'll see these performance boards. Uh, here's a US hotel, Marriott. They're pretty well run. Was in a conference there. And we went to ask the, we bumped into the general manager and asked her about the performance stuff. And she said, well, I'll show you the room, but I can't let you take photos of this sensitive stuff, which is on this wall. But this is the less sensitive stuff. But they had a whole wall of data that people could see all the time. This is Heathrow. Less obvious, but I took photos. In fact, I got moved on after taking these photos because they were like worried. Why would any? I was trying to explain, and like that doesn't make any sense. I'm like, no, really, I'm interested in display boards of performance information. I'm like, okay. Um, 
And then this is Indian plants. I'll talk later on. In this kind of environment, there's no data. If you visit third world factories, there's just no data out on the floor, none. So it's a very different world. You walk around, you are, if you walk around retailers, Swedish, as I showed, Swedish firms are extremely well run. So you walk around, to the extent there's manufacturing left in Sweden, I bet if you walk around the factories, they look pretty impressive. And there's a lot of data. There's not many people. It's pretty efficient. That's very not true in the developing world. There's no data there. So it's very hard to tell what's going on. There may be accounts in the manager's office, but that's about it. And then we asked, uh, a second set of questions would be on promotion. So ask Gabriela, um, so how does the promotion system work? Again, this is an open question. She'll talk for a bit. And I may say, imagine there are two people that joined the firm five years ago. One was a high performer. One was a low performer. What would happen? And let her kind of explain. And we go from one out of five people are promoted based on tenure, which may be family connections or something irrespective of performance. Our, we develop, identify, and promote our top performers. And what does that look like? It's started to show it in a figure, but here's an example. I had an MBA student in Stanford, uh, and I asked her, she it was actually an exec head because she was relatively senior in a global retail bank, and I asked her about this. They were doing presentations to class, and she was presenting about their promotion system. She said, this is the kind of thing we use. So I have metrics, multiple metrics on my employees. I do 360 reviews. I get feedback from their coworkers, from customers, from clients. I look at the data. This is how you do a promotion. It was, it was much more rigorous, much more rounded. So I'll go through five basic facts, what we find from the data. So one is there is a huge spread of management practices around the world, massive, really massive. So at the top is the US. This again is manufacturing. American firms look pretty impressive. There's a lot of data collection, a lot of rework of the problems arise, they pretty rapidly step in to fix them. They're very target focused, you know, stressful. These are stressful companies to work for actually. And they're very heavily focused on incentives. If you perform well, you get bonuses and rewards. If you underperform, you'll maybe given a bit of slack and then you're kicked out. Sweden is very high here. So Swedish firms, I mean, is that gap statistically significant? It's marginal, but Sweden is really not far behind. You know, you can hear I'm British, you know, my homeland, Great Britain is a bit, little bit lower down, but you know, North American, Northern European companies in manufacturing tend to be pretty well run. If you look down at the bottom, South America, Central America, Africa is really different. In some ways, I take this as a super positive story. There's enormous development upside. If you go into these country, companies, it's just shocking. They're so different. You know, promotion is basically your typically it's the son of the founder. That's the person that's pushed all the way to the top. No one else, forget it. Uh, there's no data collected. It's kind of management by walking around. There are no targets that exist. It's just do as well as you can. There's no feedback systems. Just the stories you hear. Like, in fact, given IKEA, there's someone who's telling me, one of my co authors, Sonata, she was out in um, Mozambique. She said, there's stuff that's just so bad, she couldn't believe it. For example, they used to track, they were making furniture and they drive the furniture to the person that was buying it. And she said they had this truck. And because it was slightly risky, they put two people in the truck and they put they could fit like three desks on the back and they drive back and forth repeatedly. And she said, why are you assembling them to put them in the truck? Wouldn't it be a lot easier to unassemble them and have them flat, load them into the truck? You probably get 10 and then drive and then assemble them at the other end. You're going to save an enormous amount of time. And apparently they said, that's a great idea, which then they started doing it. In some ways, it seems like really positive, but in other senses, it strikes me as really odd you do not come up with this. I mean, IKEA has been flat packing. It's just <laughs> this kind of, if you go, and it's because probably, I'm sure multiple people have had that thought, but if you're not the owner, you probably never want to suggest it because there's no reward for suggesting it may put you out of a job. So it's obvious to people, but the structure, the incentive structure is not encouraging people to come up with ideas. So that's fact one. Fact two is there is a big spread so I'm going to talk about India. It is not the case that all Indian firms are badly run at all. There's some great Indian companies, for example, Tata Reliance. I think Jaguar, the car company in the UK, and Tetley T and various things are owned by Indian companies. So India has some fantastic companies. The reason its average is way below the US or Sweden is it has a lot of left tail companies. So if you go to Sweden, there just aren't any really badly managed companies. I think the reason is market forces. If you're badly managed in Sweden, you're losing so much money, you either improve or go out of business. This is manufacturing, so tradable industry. So that left tail shrinks, it's disappeared. That left tail in the US has disappeared more or less. In developing countries, you see this left tail. And that is a, a problem in some, I, very, very many ways I put it as an opportunity. 
if you're an aid agency and you want to go out and improve Indian growth, one relatively straightforward way is just to improve the latter. Um, three, not surprisingly, this is massively correlated with every performance measure you can look at. I won't bore you with all of them, but productivity, profits, output growth, exports, R&D, patents per employer, all really positive correlated being well managed. Here's this is from one to 10. So well managed firms look better on every dimension. Um, they also look better on technology. A lot of people are focused on AI. If I'm going to guess where AI will first show up in the economy, it's going to be by well-run firms. My guess is well-managed firms will adapt to it to make use of it. Value-managed firms tend to be more inflexible. Here's just looking at slightly more histor historic data, IT investment, uh, stuff that is online. Again, well-managed firms are much more connected. For another big um, thing we care about a lot is climate. It also turns out well-managed companies are much more environmentally friendly. So this is data from the UK where we have carbon emission per pound produced. And you notice that well-run companies produce significantly less carbon. Why is that? Well, it's not. I don't think it's because they're explicitly being pro-environment. They're basically minimizing costs. So if I think of some of the factory trips I've done, well-run factories, for example, have light-sensitive, motion-sensitive lights. So I don't know how many people have visited factories or warehouses. In well run places, the light should be motion sensitive because no point lighting places up when nobody's there. It's not an enormous thing, but it's going to save you money. I remember in Denso, they had two examples of stuff that they're very proud of, like real kind of geeky right on the factory line stuff that I thought would, were clearly going to save energy. One is they were stamping sparking plugs. So I don't know if you've seen a sparking plug. It's made out of plastic, but very hard plastic, and it comes in grains and it has to be stamped under pressure. And their stamping thing, it goes up and down. It stamps, stamps, stamps. And they said they figured out that the pressure you need to stamp it, there's some point where you need all this pressure, but most of it, you don't need any pressure at all. And so you're putting a lot of energy into having a high pressure stamp, but you only need some peak thing. So rather than the stamping thing being round, it was overloid. So it goes really fast and slows and puts all this pressure and then speeds up again. So it basically provides a lot of pressure just at a very narrow amount. And they said the amount of energy for that is much lower. And they were doing it in terms of saving money, but basically it's environmentally friendly. And then another time they were saying they were kilning these things after they stamped. So you get these things stamped, you put them in bricks, you put them in the kiln. They said the amount of energy you need to heat these bricks up depends on how heavy the bricks are, so the specific heat capacity of them. So they drilled holes into the bricks to, to like drill out holes so they're lighter. And they said they just use less energy in the kiln. Again, all of this stuff was Denso trying to save money, but it meant that they're environmentally more friendly. So I think this is a big thing. If you can make companies more efficient, or in India, I, in India I saw some horrific things like people doing dying bats without any lagging. And then finally, what I talked about last time, I'm going to focus mainly on manufacturing. We we're talking a bit, bit about this over dinner. Sweden is really unusual that its schools are reasonably well managed, although it has these private schools. I've never come across. There's no other countries I know that have these for-profit schools. It's quite amazing, but. You do see in general schools and hospitals, the public sector is significantly less well managed. Why? Because it's not facing co market competition. So the left tail, like if I think of US public schools, the schools my kids go to, the management practices are just terrible. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, I live in the Bay Area, so it's not like my, kid, my kids are not suffering, but I see, you know, there's tenure and the, the school, you know, I've had the principal come teach in my class twice and the stuff she goes through, it's like, you know, so far, there's tenure, for example. You cannot fire a Californian teacher if they've been there for three years, however bad they are. Like how, that, however, really pushes the limit. I mean, there are people like drinking; it's just really bad, and they're unfireable. Um, so I'll give you a few quotes, and I talk about India. The amazing thing about if you ring up lots of companies is you hear amazing things. So one is uh, in Europe, a lot of Europeans. It's hard to know who owns it. This is a very honest person who just said, "Oh, we're owned by the mafia." As in that was, you know, we're like. Uh, the interviewer said, I think that's the other category. I, I guess I could put you down as an Italian multinational. Since, since there was no mafia category. Um, so Europeans, they have pyramiding structures. It's hard to define ownership. Americans, it's always geography. Americans are just terrible on geography. Uh, and so this was so classic. We asked an interviewer, said, how many production sites do you have abroad? And the manager in Indiana said, well, we have one in Texas. So for Americans, that's basically the definition of abroad. Um, and then there's the bazaar. So I remember this is a very old interview. This goes back to 2004. And this guy, Marcus Thielking, who's probably like running a private equity company or something. This is, you know, this is more than 20 years ago. 
And I remember Marcus is in the room and he was sitting there, hello, 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 in German, like I used to there, hello, hello. And the guy came on and said, I'm sorry, I just got distracted by a submarine surfacing in front of my window. And like, where the heck are you? Like, what are you doing? Like, it's just like such a weird thing to be distracted by. And so, of course, the interview got completed and it turned out he was on the North Sea and Thrissen Krupp has this submarine pen. And every, like, the interview just collapsed at that point. OK, tell us, what does a submarine look like? Have you ever been on one? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that was that. So I then talk about RCTs, which is a more development focused stuff. So we got asked how much of this is causal. Uh, you know, my, probably everyone here thinks it's causal. I think it's causal. I always have. But there's some skepticism. Well, well-managed firms have made money and they've hired in consultants or something and so that's a fact. So I ran two randomized control trials where others been out there. These I just know because I ran them and they you know, have good information on them. So what do we do? We went for large textile firms in Mumbai. So the textile industry, so just so you know, there's, um, there's three stages of spinning where you take cotton off the fields and make it into thread. That's called the spinning industry. And you, you harvest lots of cotton and you spin it into what's called cones of yarn. There's then an intermediate thing called textiles where you take cones of yarn and make it into fabric. And there's normally a warp and a weft, and that's fabric, that's weaving. There's the warp weave and the weft weave. And then the third stage is what's called apparel. It takes fabric and makes it into clothing. So this is a, you know, a suit, and this is a suit, and this is a shirt. So we looked at the middle stage. There's an upstream spinner I'm not going to talk about, and downstream apparel we visited and did some stuff with, but I'm not going to focus on today. So this is Texas. This is the classic beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. So if you go back, I know when Sweden's Industrial Revolution started, Britain's was about 1750. It began, and a lot of it began around, actually, uh, was, was around weaving. So these are quite large. You look at them, multi-building compounds. These are multi several hundred people firms. When you go inside them, they don't look great. So this is the inventory. This person is called Mr. Stock in Charge. Um, and here's their input. This is bags of yarn. Um, they mostly have labels, but you notice, you know, sometimes you'll find a label lying on the floor, which means that there's a label lying on the floor, there's a bag without a label. It's piled high. How do you get that stuff out? It's deep. This is in Mumbai. It's monsoonal. So when it rains, the roof leaks. It, the water could run up to there. It, it, it just, by any objective standards, it does not look great. Uh, the randomized control trial took 28 plants. We randomized half of them into treatment, which means essentially work with them for six months and help them fix stuff and half into control. This is not particularly high tech, but this is the kind of thing. Accenture is even shocked, actually. Accenture is like, oh, my God, we work with big multinationals like Tata. We just don't see this kind of thing. But they're like, OK, step one. That is just not, you need to bag it. You need to lay So they put it on racks. Get it off the floor so it's not wet. Put it into a plastic bag so it doesn't get damp. Label it, et cetera. Find out what's there. They reduced inventory a lot. They reduced inventory by 50% just from doing this. There are so many stories of amazing things that happen. Like one of them, one of the firms made shirts, shirting, and they opened up the yarn bags and they found some bags contained yarn for shooting. Now, it's really obvious you can't make a shirt out of the thread. That There's just a different thread. There's different colors, different thickness. You cannot, I mean, it would be like a hair shirt to make it out of this. It just would not be comfortable. It turned out they had made suiting, but they'd stopped making it three years ago. And it was just sitting in the back. And then he said, well, why are you? And they're like, oh, we didn't know it was there. Okay, well, you can sell it, and you can sell it for tens of thousands of dollars. In fact, to give a sense of how extreme, how well management can get down inventories, I visited Numi, which is a Toyota plant on East Bay in California that's now actually where the Tesla plant is. And I was asking them about inventory, and they said when it used to, before that, be a GM plant. They said when it was a GM plant, it was six months inventory. And then we're discussing with them and said they, it now has, I don't want to guess how much inventory it had when it was under Toyota. So the baseline was six months, 10 years before. I visited them in the early 2000s. So everyone want to guess how much inventory a Toyota plant runs with? Two weeks. Two weeks? Anyone else? One week? So, okay. So I asked them and they said two to four hours. I was like, two to four hours? How does that work? They say, we just have lorries coming continuously throughout the day. And I said, what happens if there's a breakdown on the freeway? They said, yeah, occasionally there is. And then as we just, you know, we may stop, but it's, it's never been, it's never, that was before Fukushima, that earthquake and the pandemic. So things have changed a bit. But to give you a sense, going from six months to two hours, you can see that's a 99%. So it is impossible, theory impossible to get rid of almost all inventory. These people are a year. I mean, this is just really bad. But the scale is just, so that was one thing. 
In other words, the factory should be clear of obstacles. So this is a factory. Uh, this shouldn't be here. This is a desk. I mean, that's not supposed to be in a factory. That's some old desk chairs and stuff. I mean, why it's there. This it is a far. People have to run down here to get in fast. This is actually quite dangerous. And I saw it was the 100 year anniversary of the Triangle Waistcoat Fire in New York. It's really dangerous to have. And you had the Rana Plaza and stuff blocking factory exits. You also, these are, these are called warp beams. They're very heavy and people need to get them out. There's just one just lying there. It's not clear what this is. That's not supposed to be there. So this was even more extreme. I took this photo as walking around. And as I was walking around, there were some tools lying on the floor. It's like, whose tools are these? Like, there's no one in sight. So somebody's obviously been fixing some, walked around, just left it. And this, of course, will get kicked under the machines. And, you know, so things like this, just marking out the factory floor, stuff like this. This is the spare parts before. This is spare parts afterwards. There's a whole bunch of stuff that seems really obvious. Here is factory information. I found this on the floor, hence the footprint. Put it up. This is like... The exact reverse of big data. This is treating your data as just like throwing it on the floor. Uh, we got them to enter it in every day. Each morning they have what's called a factory meeting. So this is Mr. Jubbly. He is the head of the factory. Every morning for half an hour, they just go through the numbers. So again, none of this is rocket science. This isn't, but it's amazing that mostly this wasn't being adopted. Here is the RCT evidence. They plot productivity for the treatment of control within about a year the control guys have gone up about 20%. So you can imagine you can do this in a year. You can imagine better management can increase productivity by three, four, 10x. I mean, these are just enormous numbers. Uh, third thing I talk about strategy. So if you go look at Stanford Business School, there are six things that they generally focus on. Here are the six core elements of an MBA. Finance, HR, technology, marketing, operations, and strategy. We, everything I've talked to you really only sits in two and five. It's kind of the core basics. It's the stuff you learn in the first year. HR and operations. You haven't talked at all about strategy. I'm going to talk a bit now briefly about strategy. It's a different paper. It's kind of interesting. So uh, there's a paper that uh, mostly non-overlapping course. It's at MJ Yang, Michael Christensen, Raphael Sedun, Jan Rifkin. It's a mainly HBR group. Michael Christensen is actually Clay Christensen's son. So people remember this, the innovation dilemma, it's the son of the person, uh, kind of interesting connection. So here we're trying to figure out what's best practice in terms of strategy. I won't go through the details. It was not so obvious. There wasn't a play, but we didn't have McKinsey, didn't give us this grid. We spent a lot of time focus you know, grouping with CEOs, et cetera. We came out with this grid, three things. Can you even define what strategy is? Do you have one? Seems obvious, but you'll see, we're going to interview a lot of, Harvard Business School alumni companies, and many of them, their sound says, no, there's no, they can't articulate a strategy. How do you come up with it? Do you think about it? Do you have a process? Think about alternatives. And how do you execute it? Uh, and what does it look like? You know, the first question is, what is your company strategy? And a number of people just aren't respondent unable to answer. That would be a one on that question. Up to they can clearly summarize it and give you a, a cogent strategy. Or on how do you develop it? Um, you know, do you have regular meetings? No. Yes, we have regular meetings. Do you have regular meetings with data and feedback, et cetera? You know, are, you, are, you, are concerns expressed if, there's, if someone has a concern over it? This, for example, I think would have been a big issue with like SBB. So Silicon Valley Bank is coming out. There were people that were worried what they were doing, but they weren't able to express their concerns. They made mistakes. No one surfaced them. The top, the head of the bank kept investing everything in long T-bills interest rates go up, long T-bills go down and value the bank as a liquid. And then finally, um, implementation. How does it change? change? I mean, 13 formula are pretty interesting. I, I wouldn't have occurred to me, but how do you communicate it? So bad practice, things just trickle out. People find out, which is not fantastic. You find it in the pub, you're going to change something. Up to they explicitly have a communication plan so that everyone knows so no one feels like they're the last to know and it's explicitly linked out. Or just fantastic, how do you think about resistors? So with any strategy, there's likely to be people that disagree. We don't bother to identify them. We just roll the thing out and pray, fingers crossed. Or we identify potential resistors, think about it in advance, how we're going to deal with them. So this is this grid. We collect data. This is from firms founded by Harvard Business School alum. So these should be better. You notice there's a big spread. Turns out this spread is highly correlated to performance. So same kind of idea, but if you're rigorous, thoughtful, you tend to be bigger and growing faster. What changes it? In this paper, this is like, this is like more academic. So we're looking at 
how can we get changes in it? One of the things that's fascinating is this guy, Michael Porter, generated a revolution in Harvard Business School in the early 80s. So this book now looks really old, but it was published in 1982 and it was an enormous book at the time, uh, Competitive Strategy. And Michael Porter was running the young guns at Harvard Business School and they completely changed the curriculum. So and there was this coup behind the scenes that, and apparently all the old strategy stuff got thrown away and they completely changed it. So here's a picture of the curriculum for the core strategy class. On the left is the old one that they had in 1982. It was a lot of case studies. There's a lot of how to make things change, how to deal with difficult people. It was kind of more chatty, more case studies, more examples. Michael Porter, after he came in, it totally changed. He went to all about in industry competitive strategy, IO-like type stuff. What does that do? Ends up meaning they're much better people that we look at MBAs as they graduate. We do what's called a discontinuity. So if you took your MBA in 82, you got this thing. If you took it from 83 onwards, you got this thing. We see a discrete jump. So people that took the porter type stuff were much better at formalizing strategy. The middle section of thinking about stuff, they're better. They tended out to be worse than implementing. So I'm not sure it's better or worse, but you become like an egghead. You're brilliant at coming up with fantastic plans, but then your execution is weaker. And I, I, again, we're not taking position. It turns out teaching does matter. What you teach people, we see it 30 years down the line. And then finally, how to improve management. Um, you know, there are three areas we look at. I mentioned monitoring. So do you collect information when problems are going wrong? Targets. You know, as the top managers focus short term, is it short and long run and they staircase and incentives? Are incentives there or, you know, do performers remain in their positions forever? To give you a sense of how long this spans, just in two examples, I worked in the UK Treasury years ago. I remember in my team, there was someone who was just truly awful. Uh, in fact, they shouldn't, there was more serious issues. They went to the pub every time a day at lunchtime, got completely drunk and, would, you know, no one would trust them. Up. They would just don't come back to work in the afternoon. That's like a health and safety thing. So say so you've got counselling. Nowadays, you should send someone to alcoholism, you know, but at that time, they're just ignored. What was shocking is they got a job in another division because my manager said, oh, my God, we have to get rid of X. So I wrote an amazing reference. And they're like, oh, God. So X and then X moved again. I mean, X was moving around the organization with amazing reference after amazing reference and going to the pub, probably, you know, getting promotions. Probably It was just so bad. At the other extreme, I had a student. It shows you how brutal American retailers who said he worked in Costco. And he said, I, I worked in Costco. My first month I was there, my manager, she was, we had a new manager. She had a bad performance review. She was given a warning. Second month, she had a bad performance review. She was given another warning. Third month in Costco, she was, had a bad performance review. She got barred. Now, in some ways, that's totally brutal. But I was also astounded that Costco could get someone in do three performance reviews and get them out in the space of three months. It's the exact opposite of the treasury that have someone there for like 15 years and still they're in place. So one thing is, do firms self-recognize it? We ask firms this fantastic question, excluding yourself, of course. How well managed would you say your firm is on a scale of one to 10? Well, one is worst practice, five is average, 10 is best practice. Now remember, five is average. Here's what they told us. Here's supposedly average. Where is it? Somewhere here, you know. Four, five. So, a people self-assess. Maybe that's fair. Maybe everyone doesn't want to admit. The problem is that's also not correlated with performance at all. So, what we call the shotgun blast. So, it just seems really hard for firms to self-assess themselves. So, what would you come back to? You know, I end with kind of the SNS angle on policies. There are four quick ones. The the what the um Sweden looks really good on them, but just to go through them, one is basically free markets, open markets open competition, lack of regulation. I mean, I would have said Britain was great pre-Brexit. Britain is less good. But, you know, just being open, competition is, you know, some, what is it? Openness is the best form of sunlight. Second thing is allowing in foreign multinationals. Interestingly, even in the US, Sweden, Canada, Japan, foreign multinationals tend to be better managed on average. The gap is smaller. But just having, again, Sweden's very good. It's very open. I wish Britain was more open. Uh, but that helps. Number three is being open to professional management. So if you look on average, public listed companies, private equity firms tend to be the best managed. These companies aren't always universally bad. There's lots of well-run, family-owned, founder-run companies. But when you see this as 30, 40% of the economy begin to worry. So this is, this is typically 
oldest son or oldest grandson of the owner. Sure, there's some very well run companies in this group or founders, actually. There's a lot of issue in our data. You see some 85 year old that's founded the company that doesn't want to hand over control and you know, maybe should would have been great if they'd done it 20 years ago. Again, actually, Sweden looks amazing. So if there's any chart you want to be bottom of, Sweden is like government. It seems a very good ownership structure. The family firms, but they seem to buy choice rather than because it's hard to get rid of people. So, um, and then finally, education. So I want to raise a toast to good management. Uh, management is a huge driver of firm and country performance. There are some kind of cookbooks and you know operations, HR and strategy ways to get it right. I think policy, again, Sweden's on the right path of free open markets, competition, education. I also think it's a win-win for society. You can have faster growth, lower pollution. This also means higher pay rates, uh, happier employees. We've looked at some stuff on work-life balance. Employees are happier on average and more around companies because they know what's going on. And I end with some quotes, the final set of quotes. So this is the challenges of running surveys in India. So we're running these surveys in hospitals and... Um, in order to get a hospital, they need to be big enough. So to, to find big enough, they need to have an emergency room, <laughs> orthopedics and cardiology. So, so this was an interview where I remember it's Canon Drew. She rang up this hospital and she said, do you offer acute care? And the switch board said, yes, ma'am, we do. So do you have an orthopedic department? Yes, ma'am, we do. What about a cardiology department? Yes, ma'am. So Canon thinks at this point, great. They're in sample. They're defined as a hospital. I'm now going to run the interview. She said, great, can you connect me to the orthopedic department? So the, the rule is that once they're big enough, you want to interview the orthopedic department to make like apples to apples. And he said, oh, sorry, ma'am, I'm a patient here. So the, the hospital, the main hospital number, it just rooted through to some patients. Like, it's like, what the heck is going on? I didn't have a front switchboard. Then there's the UK. So my dad and both my sisters work in the NHS, which is really struggling right now. And we have one of the questions on mismatch between skills of employees and staff. And the question was, do staff and sometimes end up doing the wrong sort of work for their skills? And the manager said, yeah, all the time. You mean like doctors doing nurses' jobs and nurses doing porta jobs? Yes, all the time. Last week, we had to get the healthier patients to push around the beds <laughs> for the sicker patients. Um, so if you're sick, you know, leave London. And then finally, um, don't do business Indian hospital. This is a, just a fantastic turn of phrase. So in the US, uh, as in, you know, the UK, Sweden is for profit, not for profit. So hospitals either be for profit, not for profit within here. They're either government or veterans, actually. So he asked, is this hospital for profit or not for profit? And they slightly misunderstood the question and said, oh, no, this hospital is only for loss making. <laughs> it was like, OK, great. Uh, and so we have I'll, I'll stop here and I know we're going to go to fun. So we have a bunch of information and data. We have this in the World Management Survey website. That has it. OK, thank you. Thank you so much. I don't think we ever laughed this much at the at a FNS seminar before. Um, so uh, you made a very compelling case for good management. It gives society faster growth, happier employers, and even lower pollution. This room is uh, full of people in leading positions from various industries, both the public and private sectors. If you would summarize just like one piece of advice that you would like to give this audience on uh, improving management what would that be um i mean take it it seems obvious so i'm like maybe it's like it's called you know preaching to the choir but take it seriously the thing that frustrates me is it's taken as given it need you know it needs time and effort it needs time and effort and you have to set aside so i should sit down because i'm joking but it, it requires time and effort and kind of deliberate focus and back when i you know i remember when i was back in mckinsey there's a rule that i think partners spent there probably, I'm sure there are people here that spent more time there, but partners spent maybe a day a week on kind of internal management or more probably, but it just, it doesn't happen automatically. So, so Nick will join us again in the panel, but I, I want to ask the audience, does anybody have like a quick question for Nick to answer now? Raise your hand and you will get a mic. Yes, just uh, wait for a mic and please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm uh, Monica Grumberg. Uh, I'm the CEO of Structor a consultancy company, and I am a little bit curious about if you made any performance reviews on, was that only on individual level or was it on group or, or, or company level? Where did you, Can you see any differences or, or was it mainly a performance reviews on an individual level that you assessed? Or Great question. We were actually talking about this over dinner last night. Actually, Eva, I'm not sure she's here, was talking about this at Google. So, um, 
we were mainly asking about individual performance reviews, but effectively it trickles up. She was, actually, she was saying it was interesting at Google that it's easier often to performance review senior people because you have accounting data for their group. And when you get people down at the bottom of the organization, there's no kind of accounts for like lowest level. In this, the idea is every person should have a performance review. You're right that sometimes in organizations like middle managers do, but kind of foot soldiers at the bottom are just, just forgotten about. So we we didn't have enough data here to in fact in another project, interestingly enough, in China, I mean that project's still because of what's going on, but we actually ran this survey of both management and individual workers. And you find the scores you get for management are better than individual workers. And one reason I think these practices are better higher up in the firm. So big organizations that can be really effective performance reviews for senior staff, but it kind of gets forgotten about on junior staff. I think they both matter. We're trying to get some kind of average, but does that, does that answer the question? Yeah. Um, thank you so much, okay, Nick. We'll you. see you again in the panel. So now uh, we'll explore research from Swedish data, emphasizing the importance of aligning the right people uh, with the right roles and how effective management supports this. Uh, and we'll do so by listening to uh, Joachim Toag. Joachim is the uh, program director of uh, the firm competitiveness program at the Research Institute of Industrial Economics um, at IFN here in Stockholm, and also a visiting professor of economics at Hanken School of Economics in our neighbor, Finland. Uh, so, and in general, his research is focused on human capital and the corporate ownership, among other things. So please um, join me in welcoming Joachim, the first yours. Oh, well, <clears throat> thank you very much for this generous uh, introduction. And, and thank you, Nick, for a a wonderful presentation and, and, and warming up the audience for me. Uh, I only have 10 minutes, so I don't have time for many uh, stories. I'm going to talk about uh, job worker matches, uh, productivity and management. And this is a project that is joint work with um, three of my co-authors, Luca, Marco and Annalisa at the University of Naples. Uh, it's a great French benefit to have co-authors from Naples. I get to go to Italy and Capri all the time when we work on this. Um, and if you want more information about it, the paper can be downloaded off my website there. So what we want to do in this project, we want to study uh, uh, productivity dispersion. So there's a big literature showing that firms are very different in how productive they are. And uh, a lot of researchers try to explain this dispersion by differences in capital and material skills or you know, worker quality talent. And then we have Nick's work who sort of brought in a, you know, a new way of measuring management practices and sort of really showed how important that is for understanding productivity and, and, and also improving it. And of course, if we can understand this dispersion better, it can, we can sort of help firms and governments develop better policies on how to improve productivity, which is sort of its key driver for growth. What we want to do here is try to understand how important job worker matches are for productivity. So how important this is that the firm has the right worker at the right job. And um, although there's quite a lot of research on this in labor economists and such, there's sort of a measurement problem here that we don't have a good measure of it. How do you measure this at scale? And that's what we want to do in this project. We want to, measure, we want to create a new measure for it so we can study it. So our project has three different stages. The first one is to develop this new measure and, uh, that can be recovered from data on firms and workers. The second stage um, that I'm going to talk about today is to, to show that this measure works. I should have show how it correlates with productivity and various other interesting characteristics. And finally, the third step, which we're going to start next, next year, is to make this measure widely available to researchers, policymakers, and also to practitioners in a very much the same way as sort of Nick and his work on management practices has made, made this data available to other researchers so they can study, um, study management practices. We want to make this available, easily available, so... Uh, um, match quality can sort of be studied uh, in various countries across the world. Uh, so what is this measure we create? We call it Jack uh, job assignment quality. Well, the idea is that you know, firms assign workers to jobs based on their CVs, and better firms have HR managers and firms that are better at doing this. So our idea is that we want to try to learn how the best firms in the economy are doing this assignment and then benchmark all of the other firms in the economy against the best firms. This is very similar to how the management practices work where you're sort of benchmarking firms against standards set by a, a sort of leading consulting firms, McKinsey. We instead want to benchmark against what we think are the best firms. So our approach here is going to use machine learning and big data uh, to teach a machine learning algorithm how these best firms are assigning workers to jobs. 
And then we can use the algorithm to predict for all the other for workers in the economy how well they are fitted to their current jobs. And then we can aggregate the predictions in some way to the firm level to get this firm level measure of job assignment quality. Okay, so it's all about benchmarking firms in the economy. And you can do this if you have data on firms and workers. And we have excellent data in Sweden. A lot of my career has been sort of trying to utilize the data we have in Sweden to bring sort of more insights of what we can learn from this data. So we go to Statistics Sweden, this is their offices in, in Örebro. We take out the sample of all firms and, and citizens in Sweden for a, a decade, uh, but we're gonna focus on firms with 30 to 6,000 employees in certain industries, but we're kind of gonna cover a large share of the Swedish economy. And we're also gonna have information on worker CVs that we construct from this registry data. We're gonna have very detailed occupational codes, which are our jobs. And then we're gonna have background information on age, gender, uh, education level, specialization, GPA, what school you went to. And we can create this past work experience as well, because we'll see where, you, where you've been working all the way back to 1990. That sort of allows us to construct these CVs. Statistics Sweden also have excellent information on firms that we're going to put in there, because you might be well matched to a job in a small firm, but you're not well matched to the same job in a larger firm. So we want to have a lot of firm level characteristics as well. OK, so what do we learn when we do this? Uh, I'm going to highlight three things. OK, so first of all, um, matching matters for workers. So match quality increases over the worker's career. You can see when you just enter the uh, labor market, it sort of increases very fast. After five years, it sort of levels out. And then monotonically over time, you get better matched uh, to, to your job. So the longer you've been in the labor market, the better, higher is your match quality. We also show that better matched workers earn more. And better matched workers tend to like their firm. They're staying at the firm, so separations are, are lower. And this goes very much in line with what theorist tells us, a, a sort of a measure of matching should be able to catch up uh, generally. Now, what matters for a good match? Um, we're throwing in a lot of things. I want to highlight three dimensions. Job experience, how long you've been in a particular job is very important for match quality. Industry experience and also location. So if you are in Stockholm or in a big city where there are many firms and many workers, it's easier to find a good match. But if you're on the countryside, fewer firms, fewer workers, match quality is substantially lower. The second thing I want to highlight from this project is that there's a, a matching matters for firms. So uh, in the learning sample, the most productive firms, this is a dashed red line here. That's what the distribution of match quality looks like. So there's a dispersion also in, in match quality there, whereas the blue line is the rest of the firms in the economy. Because it's shifted, match quality is lower, but there's a big dispersion in how, um, uh, you know, uh, in match quality among these firms as well. There's a strong monotonic positive relationship between productivity and match quality. So, you know, better matched workers, higher productivity, strong correlation in data. We can also do what Nick has, and his co-authors have done for um, uh, management practices correlated with other observables. So for instance, stronger product market competition tends to go along with uh, better matched quality workers. Ownership matters. So family firms tend to have workers that are worse matched uh, to, uh, uh, to the particular job they are in uh, as well. Now, this relationship, I should also say, between productivity and match quality, it's about 50% as strong as the relationship between management practices and productivity. So we think it's this pretty, um, you know, it, it sort of tells you that this is an important component um, uh, of productivity. Finally, Matching matters more for managers. Um, so we find that better matched managers, it's actually an important part of the correlation between overall match quality and productivity. So you need to have better matched managers, but also middle managers matter. Um, finally, better matched managers also lead to better matched workers. And we do this sort of uh, experiment where we're looking at firms that are replacing uh, managers in the firm. Either you're replacing a bad manager with a good manager or a good manager with a bad manager. And we're looking how that affects match quality among rank and file workers in the firm. And when you replace a badly matched manager with a goodly matched manager, match quality of the other workers goes up. And when you go the other way, it sort of goes, goes down. So what are the takeaways? Well, I think this project has sort of uh, showed us that matching matters for workers, firms, and managers. And um, when we think about what we can do to improve matching here is, our paper really says that getting this matching, manager matching correct, both at the CEO level and at the um, um, middle manager ma level, matters a lot um, for match quality. Secondly, a lot of the stuff we do is like 
really in line with all of Nick and his co-authors' work. So what works for management practices or obviously appears to work as well uh, uh, for, um, for match quality. And finally, um, like I said, uh, we've done step one and two. Step three, which we're going to start next year, is to make this measure widely available to researchers, policymakers, and practitioners uh, going forward. So if we want to learn more about how we can improve matching, I think this is sort of making it available and, and constructing this well-jack database that we want to do, which also allows us to compare matching across countries, um, uh, is something which will give us more insights into this question. So I sort of hope I'm, I'm invited back in 21 years and can have beers on my slides here and sort of tell you more about the, the insights of, of, on, on how important matching is for various outcomes. So that's it. If you want to know more, uh, you can find the paper here. Thank you. Thank you. So not only management practices matters, but also getting the right managers. So is there anything that you can say in general, like the key characteristics for what defines a good manager? Oh, what defines a good manager? Uh, so I, I guess what goes into the overall prediction holds for managers as well. So it's the industry experience, job experience, and also location. I would highlight those those three characteristics. And you. Uh, ended on this note on making this measure like widely available and here are a lot of big employers so if if what what kind of collaboration with with the firms and the organizations do you see like going forward well i'm hoping to learn a lot from today when you know what you think is i mean one thing we, we can obviously do is you know we can we can benchmark firms against each other right that's what this measure is is, is defined for constructed for as Nick, Nick mentioned, I, don't, I, I think it's important to reflect on what does the match quality look like, and you know if we can help firms benchmark against each other, uh, we can also you know help firms learn you know how they can potentially you know, where they are and if they need to do something about match quality inside the firm. So if uh, if any of you guys are interested in learning more about this measure, I guess you're gonna stay throughout the day so you can yes. talk to Joachim. Do we have any any questions? Yes, please wait for a microphone. Uh, thank you, Joachim. Very interesting. My name is Stefan Salian. How have you defined productivity? Oh, so productivity here in this is very it's value added per employee, basically. Uh, uh, we also have another measure, sales per employee. You can also do TFP estimations and use that. So we have these three measures we're working with throughout. You can also look at profitability if you want. We have a question. Hey, uh, Sora Arwebi from Google. Uh, I was curious to see, see if we were considering looking into also public sector going forward, as that is a rather big part of Swedish economy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this is why I'm sort of really excited about this going forward, not making it just available to other researchers, but doing research on it on my my, my own. I think sort of looking at differences between public, the public sector and the private sector, and if we can improve the efficiency of the public sector by, by uh, increasing match quality in the public sector will be something that's really interesting. We don't have the public sector here, but of course you can do this for public firms and you can benchmark them against private firms as well. Absolutely, you could do it. Yes, uh, a question here. Uh, Hans Fixer Procuritas. Uh, you're saying basically that people should stay in the same industry and, and uh, work work a lot in that industry. It seems to be the case. But, uh, we've seen, um, I have some experience with bringing people in from completely different industries to uh, top management positions. And it's, I've seen a lot of value then in bringing new practices into a firm uh, from other industries to, to, to enhance productivity and so on. Have you any comment on that? Uh, I think, uh, so I, I can just tell you about overall correlations here. I don't know, know about causal relationships on, on match and that. Uh, uh, so, you know, my comment would be, I think it's an interesting question to study, but I don't have an answer uh, right now on that. But you could use this methodology to, to try to answer that question for sure. Thanks. Uh, okay, so we've had a lot of food for thought uh, that we will process together now in a panel discussion uh, where I will also invite your thoughts and comments and questions. So Nick, please join us back on stage. And also I want to introduce a new guest, none other than uh, Thomas Ekman. Uh, round of applause. Uh, so Thomas, um, you are... CEO of Axel Jonsson since September this year, and you are 
kind of new on your current job, but yeah. not new to the job. Uh, you have extensive leadership experience from previous CEO role, roles in other big Swedish companies. So we're very happy that you're here today. Um, from what you've heard so far from Nick and Joachim, what kind of stick with you and what surprised you the most? I mean, first of all, I think it's really great to hear that to actually uh, get the scientific answer on <laughs> that I actually matter. <laughs> so that's good to hear. That's reaffirming. Uh, but but there are there are of course several things I think. In, in first of all, the uh, there are a lot of thoughts you get when you listen to both of you. I think the on the uh, first part, how do you sort of uh, when you set up your company, you do your planning, you do your uh, organization, you do your staffing, and then you do your leading, and then you do your control, and how much actually those different parts of of setting up a management practice actually matter. And you know, I think you touched upon them, both of you in in this in terms where where sort of where do you find the most correlations and what matters the most? Is it when I put out the stick and say this is where I want to go, uh, or is it how do I staff and how do I organize and and uh, how do I then lead and actually control? Control is a measure that that both of you actually measure when it comes to performance in performance reviews and and a set of control sheets. And stuff. Right. I think that is an interesting part of of this. Um, where sort of where it matters the most as a manager on what phase on that is it the planning phase or is it the staffing phase or is it no so in, the, in the data we see it's hard to know i agree it's a great question in the data they tend to go up and down together yeah so for whatever reason firms that are really good at like managing people tend to be very good at monitoring and planning and firms that get not you know but there are some cross-country differences so japan for example is fantastic at a lot of the before, I mean, that was the home of lean. A lot of the performance evaluation, you know, Kaizen, Kanban type systems. America tends to be very good at HR. American companies tend to be extremely aggressive on promotions, incentive systems. I mean, generally, these are both good on both dimensions. But yeah, it's, it's odd that companies, you kind of get this sense from reading the press, company X is really good at this and not at that. It tends to be actually, it's kind of like school. If you look in schoolwork, I think kids tend to generally positive, you know, maths and I think maths and English. Like I'm great at maths, terrible English. If you look at kids, they generally tend to go up and down together. Yeah. So in in the from the VMS, the World Management Survey, it seems like Swedish firms are pretty well managed, and I guess that's also like aligns with our perspective of ourselves. Uh, but I guess you also interact with with sort of global counterparts. Sure, yeah. And um, what's the, What's your take? Is there like a, a distinct Swedish management practice that differs from other countries? I think for uh, yeah, one if I look around in uh, in our different industries, so I can think we we tend to love structure. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. You would never see, a, or maybe you could see a warehouse like the ones uh, the textile fabric you have in India here, but that is very rare to see in Sweden because we like the structure and we like to sort of put things and we like to uh, see it in order, which I sometimes makes us slow. But it also creates a good foundation for building a very long-term business as you have to structure your work. And I think that is uh, somewhat of a difference, actually. Yeah, yeah and Interesting. structure seems to be oh, important. Good. So there's another dimension I didn't put up, actually, where Sweden is quite different. So we also look at decentralization. Mm -hmm. And it's not obviously good or bad, but just there is a... We ask firms, basically, where are decisions made on sales and marketing, pricing, promotions, investment? Is it the plant level... HR or some combination. We have a range of decisions. What you see is Sweden tends to be very unhierarchical, but I think it's the most extreme. So, you know, Northern Europe, US is pretty unhierarchical. If you go to like Asia, South America, it's very much the person at the top tells everyone what to do. Yeah. Whereas Sweden is much more like middle level, which oddly enough is kind of interesting to correlate with religion. If you look at kind of Swedish religion, it's that you know, my brother in law is in the Episcopalian and there it's the Church of England that appoints who takes over, whereas I think in some of these Baptist low churches, it's like the congregation elect. I don't know if there's... That but, and that's an interesting point. I think that differs a lot because in if I look in, in Sweden, then it's it's uh, it's not many people that sort of believe that I have all the answers. But if I go to, uh, I mean, as close as Netherlands, for example, then obviously I like more people think that I have every answer on every question, which sometimes can feel good, but but uh, it is it is a clear difference. It is. It is, for sure. Which is, I think, it's interesting, and what that comes from. We have a lot of trust, here. right? Yeah. And that also, that also is a big difference. And I would also like to invite you in the audience if you have a, sort of a comments or any different ideas about Swedish management practice. Yes, uh, please wait for a mic.
<coughs> Björn Dahlmo, uh, Landsförsäkringar. I was curious about, there seems to me to be a, a debate sometimes about what you can measure and how relevant it is. So if you're talking about the debate about software development, sort of lean versus lean agile, have you been looking at that? What happens if you take uh, tools which works fine for well-defined things and turn them into other things like software development, education? I think a few of us parents feel our teachers are over-measuring currently rather than caring about soft things. I would be interested to hear perspectives. It's a, it's, there is a general anxiety of what you should, uh, that you, what, what sort of the, or you can over-interpret it that the old saying that what gets measured gets done. And, and that sometimes is very, very uh, overthought on that sense, I'm going to say. Because, I mean, if you, if you look at how, how you run a company or if you are a CEO, then you typically, you choose a dire general direction or a strategy and then you just go implement it like hell. And then uh, uh, you support your employees and then you, you follow up or control and remove obstacles. And that's typically what you should do. Uh, and uh, sometimes we tend to measure in every point what, what should have been done. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, I can say that it's over measured. Also in software development, it is. Joachim and Nick, as researchers, you spend a lot of time measuring stuff, of course, at a maybe more aggregate level. But um, do you have any comments on this? Well, I'm. I'm... <clears throat> I mean, from a researcher perspective, I'm just excited we can measure stuff we haven't been able to measure before. That's both for management practice, and that's what excites me about my project, right? So it's it's not a problem of over measuring. It's a problem we we couldn't measure it, we couldn't study it, and now we can. So well, that's of course. Uh, I mean, in that sense, you can. It, it's easier to follow up things when you have measured. Obviously, it is. Uh, but uh, sometimes you also you also have to rely on that that uh, your own will. Sort of where where do you want to go? Yeah, I, you know, the other angle, I totally agree. What gets measured gets managed. There, are, I feel generally more measurements better. One of the areas actually recently you see much more measurement is things around bias. So, you know, around race, gender, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, Sweden is generally relatively good on a number. Of, I mean, I know it's not perfect. It's not, it's not my country, but I assure you that it's much worse. You know, there's much more serious issues in other parts of the world. A lot of the stuff was people believed there was, you know, sexism or racism, but it was hard to pick it up. With the advent of large amounts of data, you can start to measure. So I see a lot of work in social science now trying to measure that. And that, in an odd way, because it's measured, it, the issue's surfaced, and so people can train yeah. against it. Um, so, yeah, you're right that you can over-measure some stuff. You can over-manage some stuff because you measure. I think generally the solution is to measure the other stuff you care about. Actually, in the afternoon, I talk about work from home. It's a massively important thing with work from home because a lot of people can't me don't measure performance well. So what they do is they desk watch employees. And they, in the office, I can see that you're at your desk working. As soon as you go home, I can't see that. So I'm like, okay, do I not manage you? No, but I need a different measurement system. Yes, please wait for a microphone. Yeah, I'm happy to hear this, because I have to comment on that because that's something I'm thinking about. I am I am the CEO of a consultancy firm, and, and we, we don't measure anything, uh, actually. Uh, and uh, I want to challenge you on that because we're actually the most productive and profitable uh, firm in our industry. And uh, that is uh, partly because we have a lot of trust in the process. So we let every team and company set their goals and walk their path and actually uh, do their own um, business plan and also uh, decide on how they want to, how they want to evaluate it. So um, that, that's also a perspective. And so I think my, and, and one thing that's, comes up to when I listen to you is that uh, I think a lot of management practices comes from uh, the manufacturing industry or, or from the military, basically with this top-down pyramidical way of, of, of managing. And another thing might be, it might not be applicable in all kinds of industries or all kinds of, of firms. Okay. So it, it might be good in that type of industry that you describe, but I, I will also want to give another perspective that it's also possible to manage in another in another way and also have very good results uh, i don't know if you, you know, okay, what, what do you think about that it's I, <laughs> I think there's some things that are true and some things that so if i take academia so i'm a professor and if you are measuring the assistant professor i mean we have a very weird structure actually because you get hard by stanford you'll then have up to seven years to get tenure then once you get tenure 
in some ways you're not evaluated, although your salary is dependent on performance. So strangely said, we don't get any pay increases unless you get an outside offer. So for better or worse, I'll get no pay increase if Harvard offers you 50% more than their mark to market. But it does mean in theory, you could get tenure and just you know work on your golf swing or whatever it is for the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so would I say we should measure people High frequency no would be very stressful and most of the outputs are researched in the long run focused. So yeah, I think if someone is like in my room watching how many keystrokes I was making, it would be very stressful and it wouldn't be very useful. So it does depend on like the duration of input to output and there's a bunch of stuff. On the other hand, when I was in McKinsey, they were doing a lot of discussions on schools and hospitals, particularly hospitals. And having had family in NHS hospitals, I think they were woefully undermeasured before. So for example, there's that famous case of the Bristol pediatric heart surgeon who there was no data and some of his colleagues were saying like this person's mortality rate is like really woefully high and eventually they did an investigation there was like dozens of he was just basically terrible and they looked at it and dozens of kids had died and so in some senses having that data is useful and it doesn't mean you act on it but it's so i'm totally in agreement it, it, the data whether you act on the data is different but having the data there is actually mostly useful but you definitely don't need to act on it Right. But building on that, then, is, is uh, also coming back to both of you as you talked about the incentivizing or how do you incentivize? Because that, of course, comes back to that. How, how are the consultants at your firm, how are they incentivized in order to deliver something? And typically, there is a correlation here between how, how we manage our incentivizing there. Yeah, how does that work? Though? Yeah, exactly. Oh, oh, please wait for Mike because we're recording. <laughs> we're not fascinated. It's like. No. But it, and I think that's yeah it it it's all part of how you build your business model and you and you, how you evaluate and what what makes people perform, mm -hmm. uh, what culture do you build? It's all, of course, um, connected to each other. So it can't be. That's why I'm actually th thinking about and I asked before as well. How do how do you measure performance? Because in our companies, for example, we have an incentive. A performance incentive on on a on a company level. So we have thirty seven companies, and they sort of get twenty five percent of the profit back to their own pockets. Mm -hmm. But on a team level or a company level, not on an individual level. So they all want to work together to do the best they can. Yeah. For example, so uh, how you build the incentive structure is also, I think, very important on how you what kind of results you get in the end. I mean, interesting enough, when we were running these surveys, we wanted people to run as many surveys as possible. And you immediately think the best way to do it is to pay per survey run that meets a quality threshold. Over time, we discovered it was better just to pay for the team of five or six people. Why? Because you generate peer pressure and peer support. So Gabriella is great and I'm not. She's probably doing something right. And so if I have, you know, or if I'm loafing off, she can, it, it actually worked better at the, at the team level because it generates mutual support. So I agree. I mean, it, this is an individual task, but actually it's not individual because she does something. I hear the words that she uses. It's just more effective. I should copy it. If she's only paid on her own performance, she goes into another room and hides so I can't hear it. Whereas in reverse, she has a strong incentive to say, hey, I discovered this works well. So yeah. Yeah. And incentivize, incentive doesn't need, doesn't have to be money. And that's yeah. also because it's, I mean, it's interesting when you show these manual boards, when you follow up with a pen and not the digital screen. And we can see that from, from a lot of our warehouses where we have, for example, 5,000 people working in a warehouse, uh, the more, the less digital screens we use, the, the, the higher productivity typically. When you have this, uh, it's a, re a red flag or a green flag. It's very easy. Everyone can see it. Everyone understands, have I done this? Yes, no, we have not. Okay, let's do it. It's very, it's interesting how, how that actually works and increases efficiency. You will give me another comment. Yeah, I think well. one thing that your question uh, reminds me of is a discussion we've had about how do you get good match quality? How do you find the right jobs for the right workers? And one option is the boss just tells you, you know, we need these workers and that's the jobs and we need to hire for them. Another one is that it, it sort of happens in interaction with employees where you sort of delegate everything. Everybody can find their own roles. And that's what we're sort of measuring what comes out. So I don't know what's the right approach, but, you know, now when we can measure it, we can also study it. I mean, how, how does how, how do these best firms actually find out a good match quality? It's just delegation or is it it's just coming from the top? But going back to this question about measurement, I, I think it kind of taps into this discussion about how, I mean, a lot of things that we're doing is probably pretty hard to measure. I mean, especially research, it takes, what, like six, seven years to publish in a good econ journal. And it's not like you're sitting around for six years doing nothing. So uh, how, like, do you have any advice on how to 
measure performance in 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 sort of organizations and operations that is like hard to to measure in the in the short run what you actually accomplish i think it, first of all it, it differs from business to business it does for sure does so uh, um, but as long as as uh, again stating out sort of the the direction where we're heading and where we're going uh, regardless of industry if it's a warehouse or if it's a um, solar panels, whatever having a clear direction then then that typically drills down to how you can measure it and follow up and then be not too granular on the follow up okay. but be on a more general level so that everyone understands uh, where we are heading and where we want to go um, but typically it, it helps it helps to measure it does and also i think one of you measured uh, mentioned trust and so we have this have had this big debate in sweden about like trust based leadership that maybe measurement has a tendency to sort of crowd out like intrinsic incentive to do the right thing what are your takes on that discussion I think, first of all we have i mean the whole society builds on trust that's that's the foundation of, of running a company that they actually trust that something will be done uh, but we shouldn't be we should not be afraid of of, uh, of the 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 part of control or right. follow up maybe is a is a nicer word of it but but it is a part of, of running the business is actually to control did we actually do what we said that we were supposed to do did we deliver on this and why did we not um, so I think that's that we should not be afraid of that and we should use it in a in a positive way in order to improve rather than controlling it and the the sort of the, the backseat polices. Right. Yeah. Nick, do you have any? No, I, I, I agree. It's, it's funny, like oh, I know there's some people from private equity, but often in private equity, you get the sense the model is we're going to give you much more control and self-determination. You're going to take over this plant or subsidiary will give huge incentives will let you get on with it but if things go badly wrong you're out mm -hmm. if things go very well great so it's kind of like you trust them but you're also measuring behind the scenes there's something called the world value survey which collects trust across countries and it's funny there's an anecdote for i don't know i left my wallet and my phone up on the i was just here earlier and i took them out and i forgot and i left my wallet and indeed even worse my passport <laughs> on the uh, on here and one of the things you used to say, the World Value Survey, I think Norway is top, but Sweden's close at the top. It's about can people be trusted and Uganda is bottom. And partly it's, you know, I think a lot of it's due to the fact the rule of law works here. So the reason I wasn't that stressed about my work, I just didn't think anyone was going to steal stuff because, you know, people that regularly steal stuff will get caught and people don't do it. And it, it is incentive compatible. But trust doesn't come from nowhere. If you If you interview, for example, India has relatively low trust levels. If you interview Indians living in the US, their trust responses are quite high because they're just in an environment where you tend to trust people more. And so I think trust has to be supported with yeah. measurement and you know sanctions for people that don't do the right thing. So please raise your hand if you have any questions or comments. Yes. Um, I found my wallet on my phone. So yeah. they are now Actually, my I gave it to you. Uh, yeah, so. yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Watch out. No, sorry. <laughs> I'm Sarah. Still Sarah from Google. Uh, I was curious about what you spoke about a little bit in the beginning on you could intrinsically or like very rapidly see or sense that something was well or badly managed. So I was just curious to learn both from the researchers and you as a CEO, how big a difference is there between your intuitive uh, feeling of, uh, of the whole operation or a person versus measured facts and data? And how do you to deal with deal. if there is a difference <laughs> if there is a difference i mean typically that uh, that can rely back to experience uh, because the history typically repeats itself so if you send something bad in, in then you typically can find something uh, it can be bad managed or can be something else so i typically rely a lot on my intuition there uh, on that o obviously that comes from uh, reading a lot of books and experience and running businesses but so so i think there is and then then uh, every time you you tell yourself that if I didn't act on something, then I think afterwards that it was I should have done this earlier. But that also comes with the fact that oh, something made me not interact or do things or fire a manager or employ right people at the time. So there is always sort of an observation of what was, what actually was the the surroundings or what was happening around the, around that time when I didn't take the decision. But typically, it turns out to be that the the experience tells you that intuition sometimes works you know? and then you have to rely on yourself to do that and to act on it you know, i'm happy to talk manufacturing is where it starts i think is maybe the easiest which is if you walk into a factory it should be the floor should be clear so one of the basic things is things should be where the, the, you see those yellow lines 
And the reason the floor is clear is that the machine's not working. You'll see oil dripping off it, and you want to spot that quickly. You don't want trip hazards, etc. You should better see, I mean, come back to performance display boards. Um, things that tight. I mean, hospitals, I spent a lot of time in hospitals, actually. It's not that dissimilar that if you walk into hospital and there's material and good stuff lying everywhere, you can't see any data. It's slightly worrying. Whereas if it looks ordered, it probably is. Because a lot of healthcare is like repetitive and not make, I agree there's expertise in surgeons, but a lot of it's avoiding left tail things about leaving a sponge in or, you know, injecting. So I teach this healthcare case actually, and a lot of it's around uh, from Virginia Mason, just multiple checks to make sure that there are deaths from basically making mistakes. So a lot of it is the left. So in academia, it's most funny when Gabriel was asking that in academia as much as obviously I could not walk into the department and tell you that's any good or bad. It's just, it's less process driven. It's more creative. So walking into Princeton, Compared to someone else, I, I couldn't tell. I don't think it. So it seems like process driven things. You can maybe walk around and it's organization seeing data yeah. up clean and tidy. Creative things is, I couldn't do that. But what about uh, the uh, the survey? So when you started for 24 years ago, uh, 21 years ago, was there anything, is there anything that has surprised you when you've been working on that? I was surprised when you look at the grid, what the high schools are. I don't know if anyone reads the grid. Like when I first got the grid, I was like, my God, this is hard work. I mean, seeing the high score is really hard work. You're like continuously striving, always getting feedback. I'd look at the grid and think I can easily get, by the way, I'll share all the slides. I'm happy to, all the materials online, but there's the there's the 20 question grid. It's actually 18 questions because two of the original questions from McKinsey are outcomes. We're like, they're not practices, they're outcomes. One of them is about rapid growth. We're like, well, that's a nice thing, but that's an outcome. It's not great. So if you look at the practices, they just take hard work. And that's the other thing that's striking. Um, I mean, it's amazing how it translates across a lot of process driven industries in that would include re I mean, I worked in retail as well when I was there, retail, manufacturing, healthcare, but creative stuff like academia, I know, well, I just don't think fits them. I mean, this is coming back to some discussion. I just don't think fits the model. Mm -hmm. um, so it's clear that researchers are interested in business leaders like yourself, Thomas. Uh, I'm curious to know, like, is it, is it mutual? Do you do you like go to research and read all these management books on how you should do your job? Or is uh, yeah, it more I think we should be. We I do, and I think we should do it more. And that's why it's really good that I actually do this uh, series of seminars, so connecting research to or correct, connecting science to to management. Because I think, as as both of you said, I mean, typically these these professions are seen as given. You should know how you do this. Yeah. I mean, it's typically something you. Yeah, you learn on your way upwards when you work in in companies, but but uh, still, I think it's good to connect research to uh, to what we actually do, because there's a lot of management going on in the world, and, and uh, it's actually, it's a very much a two way process. There's a guy in Stanford, Bob Wilson, that won the Nobel about whatever seven eight years ago. Mm -hmm. He said the hard thing is not the answer; it's the question, yes. mm -hmm. which is so true. And it's like often I do a lot of exact head, and actually it's in the sessions and afterwards, people say, "Do you know X?" And I'll be like. You know, I just don't. I, I don't know any research on that. And that's a really good question. And you kind of go away and sometimes think that we should, you know, look into, I don't, you, you must have the same thing that. Yeah, absolutely. And we're lucky to have a board at IFM full, chock full of CEOs that want to listen to our research every time there's a board meeting. And that's actually where most of my greatest ideas have come from, just interacting with this. So I, I mean, I think this is a great initiative. I'm so happy I could be here today. So, but what, uh, what lies ahead then from the, business uh, or the management the literature perspective you've been working on the vms for 21 years what what are still like the, the big unanswered questions um i don't know you can thought in economics it's press you know its reputation has gone up a lot so i used to i first started working on what i gave a talk in harvard in 2004 i remember the joke i made back then is as soon as you stand and get into an economic seminar and you have the m word the management word like you're doing research on management people have in their minds these airport books still books right and their view of IQ is like, your IQ is minus 20, but I hear the English accent, that's plus 15. And like, <laughs> they're like, the two of them disappear off. Now they've both gone. Actually, economics in general is kind of interesting. It's become much broader. So I don't know how much people know, but you got Gary Beck was one of the most iconoclastic. We do all kinds of stuff on marriage and suicide, all kinds of stuff that weren't seen as core econ. And nowadays, it's just, there's a lot of stuff in poverty and inequality and all kinds of different topics, which has been great. The economics kind of has drifted into big data. And... So for me, it's just there's a lot more studies that you know, Joachim stuff is great. I've you know we've talked and known each other for years, but um, yeah, like the worker firm data, it's very hard. Workers matter a lot, but until you had these massive data sets, computers that were fast enough to process them, you couldn't do things like Jack. Mm. 
So what about you, Joachim? What do you see as like the the big questions to answer in the future? Well, I mean, I have a document <laughs> with like 20 research ideas. I want to do this. I mean, you can just go to, I mean, there are so many very well-written papers on, on various policies that affects various, you know, labor market outcomes and stuff. And all of a sudden we can now also study match quality. And match quality is interesting in the sense that it's potentially very cheap to fix these things. You just rearrange people inside the firm, right? But you got to know how to do it. Uh, and um, I mean, I, I mean, this is just going this far because five years uh, and, you know, it's a slow process. It was difficult to, you know, develop this measure. Um, but I think the fastest way is just to make it available to other people and let them do the research because, you know, I have an agenda, but, you know, I, I, my time is limited. So I, mean, I know what I'm going to do for the next 20 years. <laughs> but I think it's really good to do uh, your research because that will also give us an, a sort of an answer that we everyone probably feels uh, or can recognize themselves. And when you have when you have the wrong people in the room, right. then things take hours and discussions and we cannot come to conclusions. And then you can have the right people in the room. And it takes like two minutes and then everything is sorted out. So it, we, we, we hope for a great answer. To <laughs> how, how do we actually achieve that? <laughs> yeah, so we have a question here. Ian, Norcan Foundation. Uh, I have a question on culture and performance. Uh, so we have joint ventures in different countries uh, where the culture is vastly different uh, from Sweden. Uh, so how much should be centralized from Sweden and how much should the culture be the same or should they like have their own culture on top how do you create that balance between not making the joint ventures like swedish uh, and and how do you because i find that very difficult in finding that balance uh, how much should it run it on their own and how much should be based from sweden from the structures and processes any insights yeah it's a it's a constant question yeah. i would say and uh, um, when we we have a look at if i look at our companies we have chosen both directions uh, I, if you buy a company, for example, abroad, then you uh, uh, can choose how much you want to integrate the company, uh, changing brand, changing everything from values to culture and stuff. And it differs somewhat, um, but uh, and uh, uh, regardless of what way you choose, you have to choose firmly. You cannot uh, wobble around. You have to choose. Okay, you go integrate. We bought your company. You will become this company. That's it. And if you don't want to follow, then you have to be somewhere else. You have to be very firm on that if you want to integrate. If you choose the other path, which is as correct, uh, then it's more decentralized. And that can sometimes feel a bit more humble to do so. Uh, but it depends on the business, I would say. It's a lot depends on what business you run and how much you sort of rely on having a central platform, for example, if you if you run an IT company, how much how much business do you actually gain? How much synergies do you gain? Or why did you actually acquire the company or start the joint venture? So it it is both. Uh, I cannot say that it works very well both ways, but you have to be very firm in how you choose and not wobble around. That's my key insight. <laughs> so at Axel Jonsson, are you wobbling around or are you? No, firm? but we have both ways. So we choose, and and I must say the the uh, it's really uh, good. Uh, um, we like the decentralized uh, way of running things, and 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 uh, uh, so it typically works better for us when we when we do not fully integrate we actually own the companies but but we we let them run on their own and typically the the people who run the company are closest to the customer so they know for sure what's best for the customer but it also depends on what company you want to build how much right. you want to strive for it can i reverse this and ask the audience a question i was going to ask sarah and google yeah. but google big what the, how, how varied are google across country wait for <laughs> oh, nothing <laughs> i think that there are I think one challenge for me to answer your question is that I think that Google is very Swedish. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a great match between uh, Sweden and Google. But I'd say that there is a lot of similarities in terms of employees and characteristics of employees. And we are all under the same management system and incentive system. So in that regard, there's everyone you meet is very, uh, what do you call it? Präglad, um, uh, very similar despite the fact that we have a lot of diversity like your characteristics are very strong mm -hmm. um but i have most experience from europe and us so not as much from asia and africa so i'm not sure how far it trickles down so to speak but then within the company we have youtube google cloud we have engineering and we have various departments and there you can see some differences so cloud is growing faster than eva that you met yesterday like th there is a bit of a different culture to that 
But in a Swedish context, we really work hard to get a one unified sense of what it is to be working at Google and what are we trying to achieve mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. So I guess, yeah, that's my perspective. So in what ways would you say that Google is Swedish? Because it's also like the archetype for an American yeah. tech company. Yeah, but in, this, in the strong values uh, and in the strong, uh, yeah, in strong values and that we share a lot of common values of equality and of diversity and inclusion and and like a, lo a high moral standard right. somehow. Like Sweden wants to be the <laughs> moral leader of, at least used to want to be <laughs> moral leader of the world. And that's sometimes a very, yeah. A sense that I, I get also from from working at Google, uh, but then of course the management practices of how how long does it like you're evaluated and you're you might be uh, dispersed etc. That that is not very Swedish, and that's a difference, of course. Um, that is a bit yeah a bit of a tougher climate in that sense. Thomas at Axel Jonsson, you also have I wouldn't say that you are trying to be the moral leader but you do have like very high set targets uh, yeah. that you said in 2015 that in 10 years 50 percent of what you do should be things that you're not doing today yes and um, so how how are you how are you managing that <laughs> that target i think first of all it's good for a for a company like ours uh, since we are uh, running businesses uh, i mean selling an orange in ham shop in Vasastan to a pump in australia so it's a very diverse business um, but it's also the fact that we 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 want we need to push ourselves in order to change uh, because of course we can just sit back and relax and see that the companies are working as they should but but to put out this target which is which we call 1050 as you correctly say where where we say that 50 percent of what we do today is things that we do not do today in 10 years time um, and that actually works quite well because it pushes uh, the the owners and uh, it pushes uh, uh, it pushes myself, of course, obviously, to to come up with uh, how we develop our companies, how we develop ourselves. Uh, so it's good to have a, a change KPI in that sense. And now we actually added another 50 on that one, where we say that in 10 years, we should cut our climate footprint with 50% in each of our companies, which is a very stretched target. But it's, it's, uh, it's for us, I think, it's important for us as an owner of many companies to set out actually the target, set out the flag and say, this is where we want to go and, and this is where we want to drive ourselves and push ourselves to do it. So it pushes us to change. Which I and think that's is 10 years from now, not 10 years from 2015. 10 years from, yeah, we started the 1050 to 2015. <laughs> so we're actually on 46% right. change that's rate it. right now in renewal. So so it's, it's, it's good. It's working in the right direction. So it works. Yeah. So any more comments or questions from the audience? <laughs> Yes, uh, we can start from the back. Yes, um, Claudia is my name. I have a question to you, Joachim, because you were talking a lot about matching and uh, the, the benefit of doing this as a simple exercise. But what I'm really missing in your exercise is the potential of people. For me, it seems very static. You look at the experience and what has been done so far. Uh, I think we, we can agree on that. This, this will be very difficult in the future uh, to, to look at what you have done so far if you are able to master the future. Do you have any any approach in your future research for this? Uh, well, I mean, this whole measure builds on things we can observe, right? So it builds on historic historical data. So I guess it's, it's, it's limited in that sense. The, one of the things we've been talking about in terms of projects, it's also sort of how does this match develop? Is it sort of developed within the firm? What do career trajectories look like inside, inside the firm relative to how does trajectories? You have to move between firms to get the good match quality. How does this career actually develop and how do you get there? I think those types of, you know, by doing more inquiries in the, in, into this measure, we might get at something, uh, you know, related to potential. Um, but that's, that's, that's how I would approach it using this data. Just a comment on that. I think that's a really interesting point because that is actually what, what do you actually recruit? You don't recruit for history, you recruit for the future. So, yeah. so it is an interesting, but I think also we need actually the facts on how that is measured in your research. We need that in order to see, okay, what actually drives the potential for, for a person? What actually pushes? Why did that? Why we, did we get the potential? And how much did I as a manager actually uh, sort of, uh, yeah, push that person to, to uh, reach the potential? I think it's interesting. I mean, we have a lot of data in the registers, like your high school GPAs, and we have for men, men, we have the IQ and social skills and all of these things. And, you know, 
uh, you could try to figure out, you know, when you, you see in the data high, a high flying career path, for instance, you can try to figure out what that correlates with. Um, but of course, we're not going to have, we as, we as econometricians are not going to have the same data as you as your managers have, you know. So it's a question about how much of what you see as potential can we capture in the register. Mm. I have a good question about it, but we can study it, of course. Mm. No, it was just a, a, to clarify a thought that I had after I finished speaking that what you spoke about as well on the uh, interplay between uh, between the company's performance and the law and the regulations in a country. And there you can see a bit of a difference in how we relate to holidays and uh, working hours. And uh, so, of course, like the local law is really important also in relation to the company culture as such. And I think also a very valuable comment from your end, also in a Swedish context and just reflecting on being in a Swedish context in how you take things for granted and that we need to really work hard to maintain a good business climate and productivity and competitiveness in a Swedish context overall. Yeah, I thought I, I thought the UK was in great shape and then suddenly, and also, you know, living in the US, the whole Trump era has been terrifying as to, I mean, we forget he, he lost the election. He basically tried to have a coup. It was not far off. No. If, if, if Trump had whatever succeeded, the country would have fallen apart because, you know, there's no way the West Coast would have put up with it. So California, Oregon, Washington State would have pulled, you'd have had a civil war. If, if the so so yeah I, I I I'm more aware from Brexit and Trump of don't take good things for granted actually. U.S. exit for some reason. But do you see any any risk uh, for Sweden that we become sort of content with how everything is working and like suddenly lose our well managed practices? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think we all have a right now we're living in a very worrying time yeah. in general. So so and I think Sweden we all have seen that Sweden is used as a sort of a play card. In, in a lot of geopolitical um, uh, terrible things right now. So I think we are, uh, no, I don't think so, actually. I think we can still, we will still cope with it and deal with it and uh, continue with the run, well-run companies. And if you like, look historically, Sweden has produced massively good companies over the years. Um, so we will continue to do so. So, uh, Nick, you showed us a picture that uh, in the end of your survey, you asked how the respondents would rate overall management of their own organizations. And I thought it would be really interesting to uh, ask you the same question. Uh, so uh, you can go to the to the next question. Um, so we have a menti question uh, where you can use your phone and uh, hopefully scan this QR code or um, uh, enter this uh, code on the um, on the screen. And the question is, excluding yourself, how well managed would you say your organization is on a scale of one to 10, where one is worst practice, five is average, and 10 is best practice. Uh, and so it's anonymous, and we won't correlate it to your actual output. So you can just feel free to. Not to pre-guest results. Not to pre-guest results. This is a selection of people that are interested in the talk on management. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it, it could be positive. At least for us, we're like randomly sampling the population of all firms. But this, I would be less surprised if it was right skew. I'd be interested to see it, but. What would your guess be now? Well, given that the ones that we interviewed that were a random selection of seven, and I suspect this group Giving yourself selective people interested in management would put it above it. I don't know. Mm. So I, if I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm probably should have said nothing because I've now totally ruined it. But I don't, I don't want to embarrass see. anyone. But but, <laughs> exactly. But, but Swedes, are, Swedes are typically yeah, in, Swedes in are so average. modest. <laughs> That's true. We are. I think in our data across country, hilariously, the country with the highest score are the Greeks. Which is very yeah, odd. Yeah. I'm not sure why the yeah, Greeks are like. Yeah. Surprised me that yeah. not the Italians. The French are very low. The French are like, you know, life is terrible always. <laughs> let's see the results. Yeah, let's see the results. Yeah. Oh, well. So in your data, you had a lot of eights and nines, right? Yeah. So this might actually that may be... Not be. That may be correct. Right, this might be true. This, this approach, might be yeah. true. You're very well managed. So, but there may, exactly, there might be a lot of CEOs there. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Doing great. Um, no, because when you present this slide, Nick, you showed it like in in connection to that uh, um, a reason why it's it's hard to improve management is that you're not always aware of how you're doing right now. And when we had a chat earlier before this conference, you. 
Uh, you mentioned too much that it's it's really important to spend time on reflecting uh, about like how your own actions actually actually affect your organization and yeah. performance and also what your management team is is doing and, mm-hmm. and should be doing. So how much time do you spend on <laughs> reflecting? I, I think I spend a lot of time and, and the more I work, the more time I spend on it. Actually, I think it's an important question that probably all management teams ask themselves or at least should ask themselves that what do we actually do? What do you actually do in a management meeting? What kind of decisions do you take? Why? why? Because if you have organized your company where they have set up the processes, then there, from a theoretical perspective, should be what should be else, what should be done, and then you come to to thinking about okay, then we need to think about the strategy. How do we implement that? Where are we in two years' time? But typically, management teams tend to go to the very operational questions, right. like Sykkelstads frågor, <laughs> and that is that is because. You can sometimes get mixed up in your head. What do we actually do? Where do we provide value? And it feels very good to provide value, but saying, oh, the bicycle should just stand there. We should have yellow awards instead. So I think that is an important thing. But it's also the fact that when when uh, probably every one of you have realized that when you work, when you are work starting somewhere as a salesman mm-hmm. as, or wherever in the company, you work your way up and you think that the management team, they have all the answers and everything. Right. They, they have a master plan. And then as soon as you you work your way up and you come into the management team, you realize, well, this is probably the easiest job in the company. <laughs> what do you actually do? <laughs> Sit back, relax, have a nice cup of coffee, and everyone is doing the work. So it is. I think it is important to ask the question, reflect on it, and actually understand that, okay, we sh- this is what we actually should do. How do we push ourselves to, to become better in, in one year time, two year time? Instead? I'm, I'm curious to hear if there's anyone who wants to share what you answered and... Especially those nines and the ten. We're so curious to hear what you're doing. <laughs> Was there someone who? So I'm not going to answer your question because I'm <laughs> because I'm. Uh, so my name is Oskar Skans. I'm a professor of economics. So I'm from the other side. I didn't answer this, but I, I, I thought one thing that you said before which was apart from the fact that everyone seems to overrate their own quality, the rating of the own quality was uncorrelated with the actual practices, right? And then you also showed that Sweden was doing great on average. So in a way, we're sort of at the risk of going away from this, all feeling like businesses are just doing great. But the fact that there was this low correlation kind of suggests that maybe there's a lot still to be learned to improve the qualities. And there I'm curious about sort of my sense is that in Sweden, we are not interacting a lot between economists and CEOs apart from this meeting, right? So, but what what are what are your best advice for how do we get sort of insights from economists into helping CEOs? And how do CEOs, you know, what's the best way to help them to get insights from economists in a way? So how do we improve the the learning between us and 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 the rest in this room? It's, great question. It's a great, you know, it's interesting. I would, my involvement jumped up a lot after 2020 because of the work from home stuff. So for, this is an anecdote, sample size of one, so I have no idea how useful it is. But at least for me, when the work from home thing exploded, I had two papers. I didn't have a huge amount of work. Almost everything I showed this afternoon is, in fact, I'm not sure I mentioned whatsoever anything I did before 2020. But that was the point at which there's an opportunity. And, you you know, in our papers, we talk about reallocation. I know all the Shane Cleno stuff, so or Holti Ranger, but you know Davis. So that felt like I was reallocating what I was working on to something that was topical at the time. So one thing, at least for me, has been trying to think of it as a lively debate. Like the COVID era is a good time. I mean, the other thing is I've noticed is there's a lot of impact through the media. Well, I worked in the UK government, the Treasury under Gordon Brown actually for a bit, and there I saw the biggest impact that academics would often have. So I also worked in the RFS, which is very similar to SNS in the UK. And in the RFS, you'd endlessly go and meet journalists and policymakers. A lot of the impact would be through the media. It's interesting. So I had an opinion piece in the New York Times on Monday on saying, you know, the return to office is over. No one's ever going back to five days a week. And I was like flooded with emails, included 20% very angry that I think it wasn't clear whether they'd read the piece or not. And, you know, some in all caps, you can imagine what these were like. But uh, there's a lot, you certainly get a lot of engagement. The other thing I discovered is like media, um, writing blogs. Actually, it's good that economists, I've still been using LinkedIn a lot. 
I mean, odd as it sounds, I wasn't on LinkedIn until two years ago, and I've actually been using LinkedIn a lot. Twitter's kind of died. It seems like it's really dying because it's been taken over by horrible... It's anonymous, and so there's pretty horrible people posting on it, whereas LinkedIn is not anonymous. And at least for businesses, I've found LinkedIn great. But you're right, it is hard, partly through our teaching. I mean, the other stuff is why I really like exec ed and you know, this, this kind of event is you actually talk to execs. And often it's as much this as after it over lunch, people come up and say stuff. Um, get data. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, in comparison to other social sciences, they were in amazing shape. You're right that there isn't a direct hotline that the CEO rings up economists. On the other hand, lots of CEOs do talk to. I mean, it's like Keynes' thing about Evans in thrill to some. I mean, unfortunately, that is a long dead CEO. So I don't want my impact to be happening when I'm long dead, <laughs> whether it's like when you're alive. But I think media and also just being reactive has been my experience. But I don't, I don't have a you know, a secret source. It's true in the US, it's waned on the, the quality of the administration. The Trump administration, there was just disconnect between academics. Actually, in the UK, I don't know if people remember, uh, Michael Gove said, we've heard enough of the experts on the Brexit policy. And then is the following, let's hear now from some unexperts. It's like, but I mean, Brexit did not turn out well because they just said, we're not going to hear from any academics at all. Um, what about you, Thomas? What would like make you open the doors to researchers, people? come in and take your data now but study your data <laughs> uh, no i think i mean uh, these type of events i think it, it, it is for sure that we we also get more into to research actually on uh, not just reading i mean we all read books when we were to university but but i think it's also more from a practical research actually what, what like this world management survey or things you do on on, uh, on right people on the right place that typically more practical hands-on research actually uh, is really good and that that resonates very well i think with in most managers and now you know who to call if you exactly have exactly research yeah. ideas we are actually lincoln and i were talking last night on the way back after dinner harvard business review has a blog i've started to put stuff in it which is right? great yeah and for yeah. academics yeah. i agree for academic thing it just counts for zero but it's really <laughs> good to, as a way to, to get stuff out there actually that's been really useful hbr stuff and the other thing i've noticed in academic economics is people trying to publish more nature of science proceedings the national academy of science because i know business folks more aware of it and journalists yeah. more aware of it so i have something going through in science right now mm -hmm. so let let's see i mean it isn't published so mm -hmm. could you know i could get back to my hotel room and find the email i'm not yeah. looking forward to but uh but yeah that's another thing i've noticed because if you look at like raj chetty types there he's started to publish in nature science because i think with inside academia we're all looking at in economics the mm -hmm. ar and the qga but as soon as you step outside yeah. that world mm -hmm. and i talked to execs they've never heard of it but they still they've definitely heard of nature and science mm -hmm. What's your experience, Joachim? Well, just, just picking up on that, I have a paper on CEO health and how healthy and mental, what's the mental health of CEOs. And this is a paper was directly, when it came out, there was a working paper directly selected to uh, leadership quarterly, which is not like a pure econ journal. It's more like a cross-disciplinary journal. And I think it's great it ended up there because it got the attention of a lot of management researchers <laughs> that are closer to the CEOs than what we economists are. Uh, so that's one thing. The other reflection I have is... Um, I mean, uh, within academia, we invite other academics to come and present to us. And sometimes we invite practitioners to come and guest lecture in our teaching, but we never invite the CEOs to talk to the faculty directly, right? So that's something we've tried to do at IFM at times where we're just directly, we're starting a research project on this. Let's get the CEOs that are interested in this issue in the room, just, just presenting their company and then having like wine and two hours to chat with researchers. And that gives you like really good feedback. Uh, so you can play around with these things as well. And also this place called SNS seems to be very good for this kind of interaction. Um, so if we don't have any like last short questions or comments for the panel. I have a short yes, a short question, please go ahead. I, I, I want to thank you a lot. It's very interesting. And, and I also so sitting on one question is that when we went to, to Le Sand conference uh, in August, we noticed or, that the productivity of the whole Swedish economy is is not so good, and yet our manufacturing firms are very productive. So you might, if I look at your images, and I don't know if I'm right, you could see that of course we've been trimming our manufacturing industry, and we, the ones that survive in the Western countries are the top ones, and we have low productivity in the developing world. Uh, it would be interesting to see. How does it look in the service production industry or in the service sector? Because our economy is dominated by service. Yep. So do you get the same results? 
or or does that account for less productivity or or that we don't get the same productivity out of our countries as a whole at the moment so i would i would really love to see it's a great great question so two things but, one is there's something on exactly your point called baumol's disease i don't know how many people which is thankfully not a disease you'll catch but it's like Basically, Baumol, who's passed away as an economist, has said you see much faster productivity growth in manufacturing and services. But as services become a bigger share of the economy, productivity growth falls. And it is true. If you look at Europe and the US, productivity growth has been declining since World War II. My take around the management stuff, and I've looked at it, is retail and manufacturing look pretty good. My guess is Swedish retailers, because it's competitive, are also pretty well run. Where the problems is the public sector. So schools, hospitals. The government and that's probably a third of gdp i don't know yeah. most european yeah. and that that is much harder there's no market forces there's no pricing system there's no competition no entry and exit typically the public's i mean i worked in the public sector for a bit and my mum was worked in the uk government forever basically but you just you know that's much harder actually and that's where i think that's where i focus attention on actually market forces as long as you have free markets tend to fix the private sector but the public sector, and that's a huge share of the economy. Mm -hmm. That's much harder to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, one last comment, but I also have good news for you. Uh, next year's SNS Konjunkturrådets rapport is focusing on productivity in Sweden and how it can be increased. And also we're starting a three-year research project on productivity and growth. So more to come. Please, Anna. Yeah, uh, I'm Anna Beck and a uh, board professional in Systembolaget and, and other companies as well. And, and one that works a lot on sort of productivity in the service sector, which is precis digital, where I'm cherry. And we discuss a lot around like generative AI and how much in like all areas, because I think a lot of companies uh, are good in using it in product development and like thinking of new services, but not yet in like finance, legal, all different areas. And that's what we have implemented the last couple of months uh, in that sort of smaller consultancy company. But then I wonder how soon will sort of research look on the productivity gains all of all different practices? Because often you look at back on data that are, uh, I would say soon outdated uh, because the world is moving so fast. So you can't look on like 2020 to 2015 back. You need to look like next year or last year, so to say. Uh, and I think that would be super interesting to sort of chair pretty soon. And if you manage to measure those productivity gains. Yes, Joachim and then Thomas. Well, yes, I mean, we have a project going on generative AI in the Swedish economy. Uh, we're going to have a policy seminar to then see it. I think we pitched the, the SNS also writing something for the productivity. And that is, that is, that is, that project is about using uh, the balance sheet data for Swedish firms and look at productivity. And we can get that basically up until today. If, if we have money to buy it, we still need funding for that project, right? But that give you that will give you pretty accurate data. And that's needed for looking at generative AI because you basically had a shock in November. And and sort of you need to really really up, up to date data on it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. There are probably other initiatives out there as well, but but you know at least stay tuned for what's coming out from IFM on that. So much. No, I think that would be a great thing actually for for an organization like yours <laughs> to do, uh, because I agree, Anna. That that is very. You hear a lot of things. You hear that oh, we made a coding in ten days instead of fifty days and so forth. You hear a lot of stuff, and obviously there are given that we go from being a calculator to more of a thinking right. AI, of course there will be. So that's a great, that would be a great thing. Nice to end on AI. So let's thank our panel with a big round of applause.